Now you've signed upon the line and you're a sailor once more. Wake her and shake her and let her go free. Come aboard, sailor, leave your troubles on the shore. A sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea. Now the dawn is a break and so let's get her underway. Wake her and shake her and let her go free. No turn all the head and no goodbyes for me. A sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea. Your donkey has been laid and your gear it is all stored Wake her and shake her and let her go free Put your hands to the hole in and trust in the Lord A sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea Now when you're a porter there ain't no day or night Wake her and shake her and let her go free Just a watch that needs turning and keep her running tight A sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea Now your voyage is done and it's time to go ashore Wake her and shake her and let her go free Them South Ocean girls, they will greet you for sure a sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea. Now with loving and with drinking, your money is soon gone. Wake her and shake her and let her go free. Time you were signing on a passage back home. A sight worth seeing is a sailor at sea. So. Wake her and shake her and let her go free. A sign worth seeing is a sailor at sea. Oh, a sign worth seeing is a sailor at We will be coming, so just try and stay calm. Um, and if you see someone going overboard, the first thing you do is we'd raise the alarm and I've got someone pointed, not taking their eyes off of that man. It's so easy to lose sight of someone in the water. So eyes on and point, um, and then the crew will be right there. Um, what else have we got waiting? We need to take I think that's pretty much what's the safety stuff. Yeah. yeah. But throughout, if there's ever any questions or you're not sure about anything, the whales are just too big for that. If we get a gust, they will go. Um, so always keep it around the jaws of the cleat. On that same note, don't be tempted to have your hands too close to here. Again, if you get a gust, or it's, uh, it will pull your hands into there. And it is sore. <laughs> so make sure that you've got a, a, a metre roughly distance. If you're standing up, that's a good distance. These ones are quite good if it's rocky. Some tailors. So I'm a tailor because I'm behind the cleat rather than the sweater because he's above. So when we untie the line, it's the sweater's job to hold the weight. Yep. Whilst the tailor, that's me, moves in and unties. Okay. When we've untied, then the sweater can let go and the tailor can take control. And I give you pulled in on the just pulled in on all three lines. Got you. So we're easing away. Just pay it out hand over hand. 
like this. Don't let it slide through your hands because you'll burn your hands. And don't like because that's on control. Okay? So when we're hauling, always have it underneath both sides and tailing like this. Okay? Always be on the inboard side of the line. The line's on the outside. And then that's on okay. okay? When we're hauling away, sweater will pull in. Tailing will pull in. Roll the weight once. Like that. Now when it comes time to make them fast, it's the sweater that holds the weight again whilst the tailor moves in and puts that first extra in. Okay? Now the sweater will let go. But I think that the 13 point boats working out of there is oh, at the peak. Oh, oh. But they, were, they weren't very big. No, but they, they used to take them elsewhere if they yeah. were, it was very yeah. bad, I think they used to. There's a picture of a schooner, I think. Yeah. So the herring went out in barrels on the schooner, and the oh. white fish went, went up, the, steps, up the steps, oh. and occasionally off to Wick oh. on foot before the railway. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to jog in the parking there because then the camper vans park in the residence park then it just causes havoc. Mm -hmm. The camper vans will stop. Well, the camper vans are a dirty van. Just a nightmare. But if, you, if, you, if you're travelling anywhere north of Inverness really, the, the stream of traffic will typically be two camper vans, too close together to get in between them. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a local car or two, mm -hmm. a BT outreach van, because there's always a BT outreach van. <laughs> and then half a dozen high-end sports cars like Ferraris and Maseratis and yeah. Lamborghinis and things, yeah. you can't get past any. Excellent, okay. So, Inkstone, as they were talking about. So, uh, and this is, and um, you'll be stopping in all the places where I stopped because I followed the same route that you did, um, and it's the traditional herring route from here that went all the way down to Yarmouth and, and Lower Stoft in East Anglia. Although there was a West Coast herring route as well, it's just that I chose to work on the East Coast simply to, to follow that route. So the work was made, as I say, over a period of seven years. I first came here in 2015, but the work started in Aberdeen in 2013. And the reason I did it is because I kind of knew the backstory. I knew the history of the Herring Girls, and I knew the... the um, and I'd been to a lot of uh, exhibitions in small museums around the coast. I used to do books with Rick Stein, the chef. Um, and so I knew a lot of the backstory. And I was just wondering, well, all these pictures of women gutting fish in the, in the 1800s and 1920s, right up to the 1950s, well, who was doing that? They were just extraordinary, and that's what you can hear playing there. There's a piece I did for Radio 4, there was a, 
a Radio 4 half hour programme, which you can find online if you're interested. If you just search Fisher Women Crazy Eastern Radio. I was the No, 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 no. Oh, oh, there's super bots. Lovely ball. I just got to the price of license, but I had to do a lot of work to it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Want to leave, so we just make a start. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. So, well, um, welcome everybody. It's here. First of all, the the, the crew uh, of the Swan that's going on this fantastic heron trip that's been planned for several years, uh, and also just before I start, I would like to acknowledge the sponsorship, the help we get for. Uh, LHD and some of the Blanchard boats, and I see some of the Fishermen's Association folks here, great to see you. Uh, without that commercial sponsorship, the Swan couldn't continue to do what she does uh, every year, so it's so valuable, it helps keep the Swan in business. The Heron Trail that the boat has gone on, as you well know, is leaving Lerwick tonight, you're going to uh, be going to Stronsey, which was one of the main Heron ports in Orkney, at the peak of the herring fishing, and then to Wick, where really a lot of the original uh, Scottish herring industry started, that east coast, Caithness and Sutherland ports, and particularly Wick. And then going to Peterhead, which was very important and remains, like Shetland, a very, very important fishing and herring fishing port to this day. And then finally to Anstruther, uh, which has also an incredible history with the herring fishery. And the exhibition today that uh, some of you or all of you will have seen, of course, that whole herring story continued right down into East Anglia, uh, where uh, the boats and the gutters would go for the autumn fishery. So it's an incredible period of history. And what I'm sort of hoping to do today is to provide a little bit of context, as, as to, and some of you, of course, will already know this and know it far better than I do, about why it is that the swan... Uh, came to be a herring boat. What was it that happened in Shetland? In 1900, the Swan that you're going to be going in today was built here in Haysdock 
she was built and I, in her day she was one of the uh, was said to be one of the the, the most advanced uh, f herring uh, fifies in Scotland at the time and I want to give just a little bit of context as to as to how important that herring fishery was and how uh, it, it sort of led to the swan doing which is doing much of what I say is I, I cover in my book the salt roads um, uh, which I spent a, a fair bit of time researching and just at the archives over here. It was just a delight to find out from the archives about that early herring fishery and then maybe more importantly than that, speaking to people who still had a recollection of herring. <clears throat> but to place the herring fishery in context, fishing herring commercially in the North Sea, uh, you have to go a long way south. You have to go right down to the Netherlands in the 14th century. Uh, herring was always caught by people in the North Sea, but it was only really for own consumption. And it was the Dutch in the 14th and in the 15th century were able to commercialize fishing for herring. And they did that in, in two ways. First of all, they had to find a way to preserve herring. It simply wasn't good enough just to take herring, put them in salt, and eat them during the winter. If you did that, they, they would be preserved. They wouldn't taste that good. And it was a man called William Buckles in the 15th century that played around with different ways of gut in herring. And, and he found that if you left a little bit of the gut in, the pancreas, the enzymes that, uh, that uh, seeped from that gut into the salt, not only helped preserve the herring, but actually gave it a slightly sweeter taste. So William Buckles was credited with perfecting the salting of herring. Herring were gutted, leaving that bit of pancreas in, they were salted into barrels, and the barrels were then could, could then be kept for a year or two years and were exported. Salt herring was exported from the Netherlands all over Europe, particularly to Germany, Poland and Russia, uh, where it became a very, very important part of the diet in these countries in Eastern Europe. And so having perfected that way of salting herring, then the Dutch fishermen perfected at the same time the catching of herring. And the herring were caught with what are called drift nets. And these are, are, are nets that hung from the surface of the water. Um, and the herring, like most fish, swim along the seabed. But at night, uh, the herring rise to the surface to feed on plankton. And as they rose to the surface, if you had your drift net set in the right place, they would swim into the drift net and be caught. And uh, these drift nets were then hauled back and the herring was shaken out and, and was stored on board. A herring net, um, I can still remember uh, herring nets uh, as a boy growing up. Uh, uh, and they were of a size that's probably not dissimilar to that uh, brown sail that you can see in there. They were of a size that a, 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 a man or a, or, or, a, or, a, or a woman could, could lift it up and with a bit of help put it on your back. So that was a, that was a drift net and the, the Dutch uh, bosses as they were called uh, had maybe 80 or 100 of these drift nets tied together and then they had what was called a bush rope, a bus rope underneath. So when they hauled the drift nets back the, the rope was hauled up with a winch, and that made the hauling of the nets uh, a, a bit easier. Back-breaking work, hauling these nets, shaking them, and the herring coming out. And what the Dutch did, they were fishing. They really didn't fish much in the Southern North Sea. They fished off the east coast of Scotland and fished a lot of Shetland, the east coast of Shetland, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And uh, because they were so far away from home, they not only caught the herring, but they processed it on board. So all the gutting and salting and placing the herring into barrels was all done on board. And these buses would spend maybe four to six weeks at sea and would then return to the Netherlands with their catch. The herring fishery that developed in Scotland was very, very different from that. So incredible, uh, incredibly successful fishery in the Netherlands, um, which was at least partially responsible for what's called the golden age in the Netherlands. The Netherlands became an incredibly wealthy uh, uh, mercantile trading country in the 16th and 17th century. And it was said that Amsterdam 
was built uh, of herring caught east of Bressa. Now, obviously an exaggeration, but maybe a bit of a kernel of truth there. Herring was of huge importance to the, to the Dutch economy. And obviously people in Britain uh, uh, and other parts of the North Sea were looking at what the Dutch were doing. And they were saying, well, they're catching herring off our shores and they've created this fantastic industry. And why is it that we can't create a, a, a herring industry the same as the Dutch have? So in the, uh, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, the British government uh, said, we know what we'll do. We'll come up with a subsidy and we'll provide a subsidy to try and encourage herring fishery so we can emulate what the Dutch are doing. Because at that time there was no herring fishery in Britain. And like lots of government interventions in that day and to this day, they didn't quite get it right. Instead of uh, offering a subsidy to people fishing herring, they said, if you have a deck boat, we'll give you a subsidy of so many pounds <coughs> per tonne, uh, in the hope that people would get deck fishing boats and fish for herring. But that really didn't happen. And in Shetland, lots of uh, Shetland uh, entrepreneurs took advantage of that and, and built deck boats and they used these deck boats to fish for cod with hand lines. Took the subsidy and never went fishing for herring. So it re the, the subsidy to try and encourage herring fishery really never happened. But herring fishing in Scotland did begin to happen, kind of of its own accord, in the, uh, in the early 19th century. And these were boats that were called half-deckers, a bit bigger than a sixering, maybe about 35 or 40 feet and as the name suggests half of the boat was had a deck and the other half was open and uh, the, the deck part allowed a, an area of shelter where you could do a bit of cooking, you could store food and the crew could have a, maybe a sleep or a rest out of the worst of the weather. And these boats uh, fished with drift nets, the same technique as the Dutch had used but unlike the Dutch they went out every night if they caught herring, they came ashore and the herring were landed on shore where they were also, where they were gutted and salted, the same as the Dutch had done, but that job was done by herring gutters as opposed to men on board the Dutch boats. So a completely different system developed in Scotland where the boats were going to sea on a daily basis. They would go to sea at, at tea time and they would set their nets. If the herring rose and they got a shot, they would haul the herring nets all night and they would come in in the morning, sail back in, and land the herring to the uh, to the gutters, who then got them. Bob, you'll know the names of all of these little villages in the on the east coast, uh, Latherwill, Kiss. There's a whole, there's about 20 of them, and they were all really important herring ports. And of course, Wick became the absolute centre. Uh, and you'll hopefully see when you go to Wick, see in the Wick Museum how important Wick was. So this was the 1820s, the 1830s. And if any of you have, 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 have if you're interested in a, a really good novel, what, in my opinion, one of the best Scottish novels ever written is a novel by Neil Gunn called The Silver Darlings. And it's set in that east coast of Scotland as the herring fishing began to boom. And it's a story about a young boy growing up, getting his first herring boat. It's a wonderful novel. So all of that was happening in the Murray Firth. It even extended as far as north as Orkney, <clears throat> and you're going to see, you're going to visit Stronsey. So, uh, uh, so for the first time, there was competition for the Dutch on the fishing grounds in the, in the Murray Firth. But even though the Shetlanders uh, knew about this, Shetland was late getting in on the scene, and it wasn't really until the 1830s that Shetlanders uh, uh, got half deckers and tried fishing for herring. Um, and this continued for about 10 years uh, and, um, and most of the half-deckers in Shetland, I think there were 200 at one time, and uh, they fished fairly successfully. But in September 1840, um, the fleet was at sea, a little bit late in the season, the, all their nets were set and it came a bad storm. And although some boats were lost and there was some loss of life, the, the huge catastrophe of that night was that all the boats that had their nets shot, because of the storm, the nets all were destroyed. And at that time, the nets were made from hemp, which was very expensive. So they were even a fleet of herring nets, drift nets was more expensive than a boat. 
So all of these boats came back ashore having lost their nets. They'd all been financed by uh, the local bank in Shetland at the time. Shetland had its own bank, known as the Fisherman's Bank, uh, from an office up in the Hillhead. Um, and that bank was, was very much uh, the brainchild of, of Hay and Ogilvy, where the Swan was built here in Hay's Dock. And that was an incredibly important local company. Hay and Ogilvy financed the herring fishery through their bank. And because of the loss of these hemp nets in 1840, it was a catastrophic loss. The bank tried to borrow money from the Bank of Scotland. William Hay uh, went down to Edinburgh on several occasions to try and rescue the bank and the company, but all to, uh, all to no avail. Hay and Ogilvy went bankrupt in 1842, as did the Shetland Bank. And uh, the Shetland Bank went, uh, went bust, owing I think it was 60 £2,000, which in today's money is like £58 million. It's a huge catastrophe for Shetland. The result of that was the Shetlanders turned their back on herring. They thought this has just ended in catastrophe. And they went back to fishing with six arenes for ling around Shetland and fishing with smacks up at Faroe and Iceland. That was the business they knew best. That was the business they'd made most money in. This. This herring venture had, had been a complete and utter catastrophe, so they turned their back on it. And it wasn't until the 1880s that Shetland kind of had another go at the herring fishing. And by this time, the boats were no longer half-deckers, they were fully decked, like the Swan, maybe not as big as the Swan at that stage, and the, the, the fishery had, had widened out into uh, all of the East Coast ports, Fraserburgh, Peterhead, Aberdeen, and Struther and so on. And in the 1880s, one or two uh, uh, merchants, including Hay & Company, uh, which had been reconstituted after the bankruptcy, Hay & Ogilvy became Hay & Company, they bought one or two of these fully decked herring boats and they proved to be a great success. Within a very short space of time, there were a lot of curing yards all around Shetland and there was a large fleet of Shetland boats. And it went from strength to strength, so much so that the Swan was built here in 1900. And by 1905, the herring fishery in Shetland reached its absolute peak. Um, uh, in 1905, over 2 million barrels of salt herring were exported from Shetland into the markets that the Dutch had developed into Germany, Poland and Russia. There were 400 boats the size of the Swan. 400 in the Shetland fleet, employing 3,000 men. Um, and they were accompanied by, of course, boats from Scotland, boats from England, the Isle of Man, and Lerwick and Baltisan, but particularly Lerwick by 1905 was just a, a huge bustle of activity. And it was, it was referred to in a newspaper uh, editorial in one of the fleet seat newspapers. Herring, uh, Lerwick was referred to as the herring capital of Europe. So it was of huge importance um, at that time. And the herring fishery, uh, of course, continued. And it was interesting, you know, as, as sail was eventually replaced with motors on these boats and, uh, and wheelhouses were installed and greater mechanization came in, but it was still the same basic method of catching herring of setting your line of drift nets, 80 or 100, with a bush rope and hoping that the herring would rise and swim into the nets. Some nights they did, some nights they didn't. Um, and that uh, method of fishing continued right through in Shetland and in the northeast of Scotland, right through until the 1970s, where of course it was replaced with the, the modern fleet of herring and mackerel boats we have now, uh, the big trawlers, they were pursiners for a bit and, and big trawlers. But when you're sailing on the Swan, uh, for those of you, it's maybe your first time on the Swan, just um, uh, as you sail out of Lerwick tonight and you go down to Fair Island, you'll be, you'll be passing some of the, the fishing grounds east of the Bressa, and then some of the, the day after when you go to Stronsey, you'll pass some of the fishing grounds to the east of Orkney, which were very, very popular. And you can imagine, um, where you're sleeping in the main saloon, that was the hold where the herring was stored. It just came on board and was stored. And the aft cabin where uh, uh, some of you will be sleeping, that was the, the crew's quarters, then carrying maybe 
seven or eight men in total. And you can imagine the, the, the 80 herring nets being, being put over the side maybe at 10 o'clock at night and the big bush rope uh, going out and, uh, and then the, the nets would lie there for a couple of hours and then they'd start hauling the nets back at midnight, maybe with herring, maybe not with herring. But something to just think about, which just continues to astonish me to this day, having shot out the nets, the swan, like all the other sailboats at that time, would lower the mainmast. The mainmast would be lowered. And when, and just have a look at that when they're sailing up. That huge mast every night was lowered down. And the reason for that was, going back to the gale of 1842, these herring nets were so fragile and if you're hauling these herring nets in and it came a poor night and you had this huge mast, you can imagine it would make the boat roll more, so the chance would be you'd probably tear your nets, uh, even on a, another bad night. It, it, you'd just be having too much damage to your net. So all of these boats lowered their mast. And having lowered their mast, they then got all the nets on board, got the herring in the hold, and they had to sail back home. The first they had to do, maybe after hauling nets for six or eight hours exhausted, they had to haul up that mast again. An incredible feat of, of not only engineering, but human strength. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they had to do that every night. And uh, I, some of us who were involved in the Swan have often wondered, you know, what sort of block and tackle they would have had and how that would have been done. But like everything else, they were doing it every night. I'm sure they became very, very good at it. Um, I remember my father telling me that uh, his father, my grandfather, um, as a young man, was in the, went herring fishing in the last days of sail. And the way these, these old herring fishermen who fished with sailboats, they used to say that, hauling that mast back up every night was the same amount of work as hauling about a third of the nets. That's the way they, they described it. You know, you, you hauled all those nets and then for the exertion, maybe not the time, but the physical exertion was like hauling another third of the nets to get that mast back up. So, um, I, I thought what I'd do just to finish off and then, we, you know, if there are any questions or any discussion that might be, be useful, uh, we can have a chat about that. But, but that, I hope, puts a little bit of context into what the swan did every night. She continued fishing in Shetland until 19... Uh, Brian, keep me right, 1956? Would that be right? 55. 1955. And by that time, she had an engine, she had a wheelhouse, she was fishing with this in the winter time for white fish, but in the summer time she was doing catching herring in exactly the same way as the Dutch had caught herring in the 14th century. The method of catching fishing hadn't changed. It was drift nets hauled back by a rope. Of course, the, the winch was driven mechanically by that time. There were no masts to lower or put back up. The engine power took you to sea and engine power took you ashore. There were no sails. Um, but the, the, the method of fishing hadn't changed. And I thought what I'd do just to finish off is to, is to read a little bit from my book. And the herring fishing using drift nets continued into the early 1970s. And I feel uh, 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 I, I'm, I'm old enough to, to, to have been a small boy in the 1970s. Um, but I feel incredibly privileged um, to have been to sea with a boat fishing for drift nets and just to, you know, in my childish way have to have captured uh, what that was. And I know, um, uh, Ian, you spent, when you were at school, you spent a week at the Herring. And, and you know, people our age in Shetland, you'll find a, a lot of people who not only were Herring fishermen with drift nets, but a lot went to sea for a night or two just to see what it was like. But one time, 3,000 Shetland fishermen were doing this night after night. So this is a, a, a bit from my book. Uh, called, and this was set in the early 70s, called The Night at the Herring. For as long as I can remember, I had wanted to spend the night at the Herring with my father. He always said I was far too young, and I suppose he had a point when I was eight or nine years old. He eventually, he eventually relented when I was ten.
So what is that, Maggie? <laughs> this uh, this tune over here is called Sandwich. Right. Um, and right. this this um, plant coming out here is called Nonus. Uh, it's called what? Nonus. Right. Yeah. Right. And you were you were mentioning the brook, which oh, is yeah, over there. See it. Over here, so that's yeah. the Pictish Brock. That's it there, that. Yeah, it's uh, painted green. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then Scott's busy catching mackerel. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the, you, you say the ocean plat? Uh, yeah, this pattern is called an ocean plat. There's one that's finished behind Anya. Yeah. Um, so that's what it'll look kind of like when it's finished. Well, it's. That you could, is you, this. So you could, you could use it for like a doormat. Exactly, yeah. Anything that wants to protect something. So a doormat or to right. protect a bit on the deck. And this is one that we started. Um, and we haven't quite tightened it up, so you just got to go around every individual line and just pull through the slack. So it takes some time to right. to get it. Uh, so that's it. And a turksman, a turksman's head is just when it's that little like what we, or is that turks head can be uh, so an ornament around turks head can be an ornament around like a handle or the the top of the flagpole yeah. going on.
I thought I would look the part. I thought I uh, put me nautical look on. would be um, part of the uh, crane, the, the jib would be sticking out over the, over here. Ah, must be pulling the boats in. And here's the type of boat, the typical of this area based on the <coughs> Viking longboats pointed at both ends that's an old one timber here's a new one or a restored one Fair Isle South Lighthouse the lighthouse here Fair Isle South is one of the over 200 that were located around Scotland. Right. Oh, there's Princess Anne. Right, it's looking down the lighthouse. Rock station. Oh, the Stevenson's. Yeah. I think there were, yeah, there were relatives of Robert Louis Stevenson, not George. Oh, there's two of them! <laughs> Maybe if we go off that thing, we'll have Are you going to jump in? It's like cold water shock. I'm forcing to the ladder over there. Oh. oh, that would be good to jump in from there. Jump as far as far as you can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in fact, we were talking about that. That, um, that Ossie was going to be the first person to do the. Oh, no, that doesn't look It's tropical. It's tropical. Oh, I thought it was going to jump. It's not as bad as I'd expect. It looks cold, doesn't it? Wait! Oh. <laughs> 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 I used to be <laughs> Oh, that didn't last long, did it? <laughs> <laughs> You go next, Maggie. Yes, you go next. That's a that's a way to wait.
Is there anybody else going in? I'm not, I'm not going in. You sure? I'll hold your camera for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll even film you. I'll hold your flex for you. No, I've, got no I, I, I've, got, I've got the right boots. <laughs> I've seen the sheep. Yeah, the sheep. I think that was maybe um, big country.